then and now. What we bought, what we were sold, and what we lost. Since it's gotten to the point where our intelligence and or morality is based on whether we wear a mask or whether we trust the official narrative, consider the following. History has shown us that creating chaos allows people in authority to take control of a society rather effectively. By throwing the public endless contradicting guidance, Eventually, there's bound to be a fear-laced fastball tailored for every man, woman, and child. It's a brilliant, yet very old tactic designed to catch and control as many fish as possible, simply by using a very wide net. When a crisis reaches its pinnacle, the powers that be are absolutely wagering that you'll choose whichever narrative that is most relative and ultimately the most terrifying to you as an individual. Let's dig into specific examples of this chaos with verifiable sources. We were originally told that the medical system was going to be overwhelmed by the virus. So we had to flatten the curve by keeping everyone home and socially distanced. We were told that participating in these drastic measures would help us defeat the invisible enemy so that we can negate the virus as a threat within our society. We were then told that actually, no, these measures won't really prevent the spread because most of us will eventually be infected. In fact, we're now told that in reality, the only thing a lockdown can really hope to accomplish, aside from destroying the economy, is help prevent all of us from catching the virus at the same time. We were originally told that public spaces, playgrounds, parks, and beaches must all be closed and restricted in order to prevent the spread of the virus via large outside gatherings. Now we're told that it's fine to go to the beaches and parks, despite the fact that as a country we're seemingly witnessing some of the highest number of virus deaths since the beginning of the crisis? We were originally told that masks do not help stop the spread of the virus in any significant way and in fact may be harmful. Two months later, we were then told that masks actually do significantly limit the spread of the virus and the excuse for the original position is that we simply didn't want people to diminish the medical establishment's mask supply and or we somehow didn't actually understand how this particular coronavirus spreads since it's unique or novel. We are given this outlandish excuse, despite the fact that the fundamentals of disease transmission applies to all coronaviruses, novel or not. We were originally told that homemade or cloth masks let through more particles facilitate self-contamination and thus can result in higher infection rates. However, as an increasing number of people disobeyed varying degrees of their local lockdown orders, were then ultimately told that cloth masks actually work great in preventing the spread of the virus and that we must social distance. We were originally told that the virus can last for days on contact surfaces and that we must be extremely cautious by disinfecting everything. We're then told that the virus actually does not spread easily on surfaces and that the vast majority of cases were transmitted via airborne particles. After all, hand washing is somewhat measurable, while airborne particles are invisible, uncontrollable, and therefore terrifying. We were originally told that asymptomatic people can spread the virus and even contribute to community super spreading. We're then later told by top experts that asymptomatic transmission is in fact very rare. When this new information got out and a moment of relief was nearly felt, we were then quickly told yet again that asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people may in fact be spreading the disease after all, based on very early studies rather than any research from more recent studies. 
We were originally told that based on extensive studies, children were highly unlikely to be significant carriers or transmitters of the disease. Now that school season is here, we're being told that kids are becoming infected with the virus in high numbers, and that we all need to consider the seriousness of this growing threat. Contrary to the above, the one message that has remained consistent throughout all of this is that we are all in this together, even though we may be apart. Unless you're closer than six feet, in which case we need to be further apart in order to remain together. But all that was yesterday, that was then. We still have over 70 days left until the election. The election, of course, is just another distraction to keep you from noticing the bigger things that will directly impact your lives. So what can you look forward to in the near future? New Zealand has implemented quarantine camps. If you live in New Zealand and you voluntarily get tested and are positive, you go to a special camp and are not allowed to leave for 14 days. You then have to take another test before they will let you go. Here's where it gets interesting. If you refuse to be retested, they assume you still have the virus and hold you for another 14 days, and they will keep doing that until you give in. It's fine, though, because it's not where you are, right? Nothing to worry about, I'm sure. But maybe I didn't get your attention with the camps. How about this? At the Dubai airport, the busiest international air hub, they have deployed virus-sniffing dogs. You stand in a ticket line. If you look even remotely sick, you are moved to a second line and they give you a Q-tip to rub under your armpit. The Q-tip is then given to the dog. If the dog sits in front of you, then you are formally tested. They claim it has a 91% success rate. But that's international foreign countries and whatnot. It's not in the land of the free, home of the brave. Everything back home is still stable, right? In a recent Gallup poll, 30% of Americans said that they would turn down the vaccine right now, even if it was government approved and free. How do you think that's going to play out in the months to come when it becomes mandatory? These numbers are, as expected, dividing along party lines. 81% of Democrats said they would get the vaccine, compared to only 47% of Republicans. A teenage hostess at Chili's in Louisiana was attacked by dining guests after she tried to enforce social distancing at a restaurant. Kelsey Wallace, 17, was beaten down after she told a group of 13 people they could not sit at a single table citing company rules. The diners became upset and attacked her before she could get to the manager. What's even more interesting is that no one in the restaurant stepped in to help and the managers let the party leave the restaurant without incident after the beatdown. The hostess was outraged by this and has since quit the restaurant. No charges have been filed. Keep in mind that this is one of the restaurant chains that survived the initial state restrictions. What the media is not telling you is how many different companies have closed since this all began. Because of the lockdown measures, a number of companies are now gone. Here is an incomplete list of corporations that have either shuttered for good or have filed for bankruptcy. Bed Bath & Beyond, Body Works, Earth Friendly, Victoria Secret, Microsoft Store, 83 stores closed, McDonald's, 200 closures, Nordstrom, 8 closures, Pier 1 Imports, 450 closures, Walgreens, 950 closures, Dunkin' Donuts, 800 closures, J. Crew, The Gap, Forever 21, 350 closures, GameStop, Calvin Klein, Chico's, 100 closures, White House Black Market, Kmart, Pizza Hut, Sears, Bose, Men's Warehouse, Express, Lord Taylor, Neiman Marcus, Macy's, 30 closures, Hallmark, Papyrus, Lucky's Market, Kay's Jewelry, Zales and Jared, Amber Crombie and Finch, Gymboree, GNC, Destiny Maternity, Odell's, and Christopher Banks. But all this 
as you can imagine, is only part of the carnage. Small businesses on your streets are closing so quickly it's hard to see the full scope of what's happening. The reported damage recorded so far in 2020 is staggering, and I'm sure it's still being underestimated. The rating service Yelp stated that from March 1st to July 25th, they lost 80,000 listings because the businesses closed permanently. 20,000 of those had five or more locations. The remaining 60,000 stores broke down like this. 2,500 were in event planning, 3,600 were in automotive, 5,000 were in beauty, 7,900 in retail and shopping, 12,700 restaurants, and the other 28,500 were divided among many smaller categories. And these closures are still part of a cascading effect. Most of the closings were because the shops couldn't bring in enough customers to cover their rent. As they leave, they will create a huge excess of retail space and drive down property values, which affects other things. I'll cover the ensuing ripple effects in the weeks to come. As this cruel summer mercifully draws to a close, try to keep a cool head because the virus pressure cooker we are all in is far from over. Keep your eyes open and don't just read the headlines with the biggest letters. 2020 is full of misdirection and sleight of hand. Make no mistake, the next big deception is right around the corner. I was going to end this with a virus joke, but changed my mind. Not because it's too soon, it's because there's a 99% chance you won't get it. <laughs>